You can now follow me on all my social media platforms to find out who my latest guest will be. And don't forget to click the subscribe button and the notifications button so you're notified for when my next podcast goes live. And then they talk to me about, you know, if you learn Chinese when you leave the Marines, or if you do leave, you can get into the CIA and the FBI. Like, little do they know that I wanted to join the IRA. You know, if, they, <laughs> if they'd have known that, they'd, yeah. have, they'd have strung me up, you know. We're going to need driver's licenses to buy guns, fake driver's licenses and other uh, resources. So that's when I first met James Whitey Bulger, the notorious, you know, gangster. And on our way in to Kenmer Bay to land the guns, we were stopped by the Irish Navy and arrested. And uh, we were brought to uh, Cork, interrogated, uh, charged, and then sentenced to 10 years in prison. Of 196 countries in the world, the British have invaded or had a military presence at some stage in 171 of them. So they're absolute experts. We were on an escape attempt in 1985, 12 of us made a break for freedom. There was 14 gates, we got through 13 of them. And the, uh, the, the explosives we put on the last gate actually buckled the gate. And uh, the second charge we put on to blow it out uh, didn't go, unfortunately. That is how the British, uh, uh, that's how a small country like Britain conquered half the world. They get one side to kill the other side. You know, they're master manipulators. And it, it, it's, it's very hard because um, it only works to the benefit of the enemy. It only works to the benefit of the British when Irish are killing Irish. It doesn't work to any, you know, it doesn't work to any Irish benefit, you know. We came up with a, a plan to um, uh, disrupt the electricity in the South Hippies of England for a period of time. Uh, we weren't sure how long it would take because we weren't sure how long it would take the British to, to respond to it. But uh, we were uh, caught then in London. Again, I believe we were informed on, again. And uh, we uh, ended up getting 35 years. Boom, we're on. Today's guest will be John Crawley. How are you, John? Great, James. Thanks a million for having me on. So Pleasure you, to be here. Great to have you on. You just released the book, The Yank, yeah. a former Marine who then went on and worked for the IRA. That's right. Uh, Sam Miller put, read your book as well, and he says you're the Jason Bond of the IRA. <laughs> that you are uh, recon of the Marines as well, born in New York and involved in some of the biggest that's a madness probably in life that people would be shocked to hear you get a 10 stretch you also got 35 years after that yes. like, no mean feet like, yeah. but you're still here to tell the tale here to tell the tale <laughs> first and foremost how are you I'm great James thank you very much thanks Brilliant. for coming to Glasgow brother thank and uh, we'll get in about your story but first of all I'll go back to the start of my guests where you grew up and how it all began well I was born in Long Island New York in, uh, in May 1957 to um, Irish immigrant parents my father was an immigrant from County Roscommon. My mother was from County Kerry. Uh, my father was in the U.S. Air Force at the time. He was doing a four-year stretch to get um, uh, some technical training and to accelerate his American citizenship. At about two years of age, uh, we left uh, New York. So I don't remember New York at all. Moved to Chicago. Uh, I grew up basically in Chicago. Uh, when I was 13, came back to Ireland for a full summer. Loved it. Uh, and then the following year, when I was 14, I came back to live in Ireland for good and go to school here. Yeah. I mean, to go to school in Ireland, yeah. How, just, how was it at school in Ireland at the time? Well, it was strange. I, you know, leaving an American high school, going to a, a country school, Donner's Common, that my father went to. In fact, one or two of the same teachers were, were there, you know. But I enjoyed it. I loved it. I, I took to it, you know. I had a sister who went to boarding school and didn't like it at all. Went back to America. But I just took to Ireland and I loved it. And I loved everything about it. Yeah. The, the troubles weren't were they started when you were at school then. The, eh? the troubles had started, but they I was down on Ross Common, so it didn't mm -hmm. it had no effect on us whatsoever. So you didn't really know anything about it. I didn't know anything about it. No. When did you go back to America? Went back to America in nineteen seventy five at eighteen years of age to join the U.S. Marines. What gave you that idea to do that? Because of your father? No, no, not at all. I uh, I had developed very strong Republican sympathies. I had been uh, reading a lot, studying about about the, the struggle. Um, I had some family involvement. My granduncle was a senior IRA man in the Black and Tan War. 
And uh, but his brother had been in the British Army and was killed with the Irish Guards in the First World War. So you know you had this typical Irish different trajectories that Irish people went through. Some you know uh, fought for Britain, some fought against it. Uh, but I, I developed strong Republican sympathies, and it was my own education and my own study. I didn't really have any. Well, I definitely didn't have any uh, Republican propaganda they got at home. I had no mentor. I had nobody telling me stories about the struggle. It was just, you know, reading uh, history. And I developed, uh, you know, a strong sympathy with the Republican struggle in the North. Uh, having grown up in the States, I had a strong Republican ethos anyway, because the United States is a republic. Uh, we grew up every day, you know, we say, we say the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag and we talk about things like the republic for which it stands, one nation indivisible with liberty and justice for all. And those words resonated with me. And I thought Ireland should, you know, have the same chance to be in a united republic. Uh, and uh, so I made up my mind when I was around 17 or 18 to join the IRA. Uh, trouble was I didn't know anybody in the IRA. It's not called the secret army for nothing. Um, so I basically decided what I would do was I would go and join the U.S. Marines because I was an American citizen. Uh, I would try to get into a special forces unit, get the best training I could, and come home. And for two purposes, uh, basically to test my commitment that if I was, I knew that if I went away for four years and came back and still joined the IRA, then I was committed to doing that. If I wasn't deflected or diverted by, you know, career opportunities or other things that could come up. Uh, and the other reason was to get was to was to enhance my own professional development. Um, I didn't think the IRA needed my help or anything like that. I believe the IRA was this highly professional uh, force, uh, highly trained force that I kept hearing about, mostly hearing about from the British, mm -hmm. uh, the most professional, deadliest guerrilla army in the in in Europe, if not the world. And uh, so I didn't think they needed my help. That's not why I joined the Marines. Just like I said, to enhance my own professional development and to uh, test my commitment. And uh, that's basically what I did. So I spent four years in the U.S. Marines. Uh, I got into the Marine Recon Unit. I um, became an instructor. I made sergeant in three years. And uh, I got out of the U.S. Marines on the 29th of May, 1979. At 8 in the morning, I was discharged. And at 2 o'clock that afternoon, I was on a connecting flight for Ireland. So that was just your plan straight away? That was my plan. Learn the craft, yeah. get some intelligence basically become a great soldier where you could help out if need be. Yes. So you weren't forced. Usually a lot of people have had a few guys on from the IRA. They've kind of, maybe it's their brother who's led them there, their father, yeah. their best friend or someone they know close to them has been killed where they thought, fuck this, like, I want to help fight for a cause. But you never had any of that. No, no. I mean, the IRA is a volunteer organization and they call themselves volunteers, but I was a volunteer in every sense of the word. I absolutely and totally volunteered. I didn't have. I didn't volunteer from a sense of revenge, from uh, 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 any other reason than my belief that the British government had no right to be in Ireland, and that um, men and women were fighting for the full freedom and independence of Ireland. And but at this stage, I looked in Ireland as my country, not the United States. Although I mean, I don't have anything against the United States. I just, I just looked on Ireland as my country. And uh, I wanted to fight for it. And I thought, I would have thought that, you know, uh, that's what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to fight for your country. So um, that's what I did. And uh, it took me a while to get to join up because I didn't know anybody in the IRA. Eventually, like I had, it's all laid out in the book. I eventually met a fellow who had been in prison. Uh, he worked on a building project. I got a job there. I latched myself onto him. Uh, he rapidly guessed my intentions from the questions and everything I was asking. And uh, he tried to talk me out of it, actually. He, he really did try to talk me out of it. He, he had left the IRA, and he I remember him saying to me one time he didn't think the leadership in Belfast or Derry could be trusted. I had no idea what he meant by that. And I just shrugged it off as somebody who was um, trying to justify his own retirement from the struggle. And uh, he must have said it to somebody, because eventually a fellow from County Tyrone approached me. And one thing led to another, and eventually I was um, given some lectures and... Uh, I was sworn into the IRA eventually, yeah. What was the training like for the Marines? For the Marines? Yeah. Well, you know, um, you know, most most war movies or, or most military movies that you see are basically extremely unrealistic. But if you want to know what Marine Corps boot camp is like, watch Full Metal Jacket. Full Metal Jacket, the boot camp part of it is exactly how it was. 
I mean, the drill instructor in it was actually a, a Marine drill instructor. And the things he says in it, you know, I didn't know they stack shit that high. Steers and queers come from Texas. You know, almost all that stuff. It must be like a script. Heard it all in boot camp, right? Uh, boot camp was, uh, was a tough initiation into the Marine. So boot camp's only 13 weeks. And you, you don't train that much. It's really harassment and uh, more or less testing your mettle. It's only after boot camp that your real training begins. And uh, after 13 weeks in boot camp, <clears throat> excuse me, I went to advanced infantry training and I kept trying to volunteer for recon. And the thing about it is, and I say in the book, like, whereas the army special forces would sign guarantees that they'd send you to the training. Now, there's no guarantee you'll make to make the training. The vast majority of people don't get through the training, but at least they guarantee they'll send you. Marines wouldn't do that. So I took a bit of a chance joining them. But uh, eventually, eventually, uh, I got into recon, although along the way I had a lot of, pro I mean, people were literally laughing at me. I mean, at the time I was 18, I looked about 12, I think. <laughs> I was about 10 stone, hard to believe now, you know. <laughs> I was like a little weed, you know. And, you know, picture people picture special forces as these, you know, Rambo types and all, you know, and I probably did too. But uh, I remember when I actually got to, re to, to, to the recon indoctrination program, which is the six weeks initiation torture session for six weeks, uh, you know, there was about, a dozen other guys there, and I was looking around me at these, these muscle-bound Adonises and these high school wrestlers and these weightlifters, and I remember thinking, oh my God, I don't have a chance here, you know? And within about three days, they, <laughs> half of them were crying and going home, you know? So it was my first real, um, my first real initiation into the concept that it's not the size of the dog in the fight, it's the size of the fight in the dog yeah. that runs through in the end, you know? And, uh, so I got through the indoctrination program, got into the recon teams, and then, you know, with very intense training, uh, I enjoyed being in recon, actually, once I got into an actual unit, because uh, we worked basically in four-man teams, was the training was behind enemy lines, and uh, I did scuba training, and I did parachute training, and I did, you know, submarine training, going in out of a submarine submerged at night and swimming ashore, coming back into it. You know, pretty exciting stuff, you know. But it was interesting. But what I really liked about recon, I think, was that it wasn't like in the infantry. In the infantry, they tell you in the Marines, you're not paid to think, you're paid to react. In recon, because you're behind the lines, because you have no officers, and because there's nobody you can ask, you know, for permission to do anything, you have to think for yourself. So it was a unit with a lot more initiative and a lot more, um, yeah, uh, very interesting, uh, very interesting time. Uh, really good guys. Um, and uh, yeah, it was, it, 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 the, the, you know, it was excellent training. And uh, I learned a lot about leadership and I learned a lot about, um, uh, you know, what motivates people. Uh, and, you know, learned a lot about, you know, it's it's not what you say, it's what you do that counts, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. What is recon for people who don't know? That's oh, I'm sorry, it's reconnaissance. Yeah, so that's the elite of the elite. That's that the elite of the Marine Corps. It, Special it's, forces. At, at the time, yeah. Now um, now it's it's called MARSOC, Marine, Marine Special Operations Command. But in my time, it was the Marine Special Forces Unit. Uh, and it was basically, you're basically trained to go behind enemy lines and gather information, carry out raids, ambushes, that type of thing. Uh, call in artillery, airstrikes, naval gunfire, you know, very comprehensive training, a lot, a lot far more than you would get in, um, you know, in, uh, in, in an infantry unit. Um, I remember, uh, being told one time I was calling in airstrikes one time, F4 Phantoms, you know, calling in airstrikes on a, on a training mission. And uh, I remember the officer there telling me he he had worked with some South American army. And he says, down there, he says, you have to be a colonel before they let you use a radio. Like, you mm -hmm. know, but there was I, like a Lance Corporal calling in airstrikes, you know. So it was just, just you know, a, a great difference in initiative and that type of thing. What's the training like to be in recon? Well, uh, well it's tough physical training. I mean, uh, the toughest thing, I, I there's two disadvantages that I found that, made me kind of concerned I mightn't get through the training. One was I don't like heights and you have to parachute out of planes. But, you know, like somebody once said, you don't got to love it, you just got to do it. And then um, the, I wasn't a very strong swimmer. I actually lied when I when I, when I when I got interviewed for recon, you have to be a first class swimmer. And I lied and I said I was, I, I was a second class swimmer and said I was first class, you know. But fortunately, the captain interviewing me didn't look at my records, you know. I was I had I did have a first class physical fitness test and all that, but uh, 
I found the swimming some of the toughest training. You know, the underwater stuff, mm -hmm. you have to go in the water, your your arms and, you know, your feet are tied together, your arms behind your back, you have to bounce off the bottom and you have to do what they call drown proofing, things like that. And uh, it, it can really psych you out uh, diving underwater at night, pitch dark blackness, you know. I was literally after seeing the movie Jaws, then 1975, Jaws just come out, and I seen it just before I went to do scuba training in the Philippines. Mm -hmm. So I remember diving underwater at night in the, in, you know, in the South, in the Pacific, wasn't a very re relaxing experience, you know. But uh, no, it was all good. It was all good. Uh, but it, it's like, um, <clears throat> it, it, you know, it is 90% mental. It's psychological, you know. It's like they say, it's mind over matter. If you don't mind, it don't matter, mm -hmm. basically, you know. What's the main ingredient, you think, for people to pass these courses? Like you say, it's not the... The size of the dog is like yeah. But what do you think? The dog. Yeah, what do you think the main ingredient is for people to pass that? Like you're a young kid, ten yeah. stone. Yeah. People are probably laughing at you. Yeah, they were you laughing at me these, literally. Like 14, yeah. 15 yeah. stone men yeah. crying like little babies. Yeah. Like yeah. we actually spoke about that in the car yeah. Yeah. before. Yeah. Like we're talking about so-called gangsters. People yeah. expect them big and burly yeah. with slash marks, but yeah. <clears throat> it's all about not breaking. As a tough man, people who don't fucking quit, people who never say die, like, yeah. what would you say the main ingredient is for people to pass these sort of courses? It's just an, an absolute determination not to fail. No, a, a determination not to fail. And as like we were talking about earlier, like, you know, you'll often hear the concept of a hard man, see some guy with a shaved head tattoos, and he, he might beat the shit out of somebody, you know. But to me, a hard man, a real hard man is hard on himself first. You know, if you can be hard on yourself, if you can be tough on yourself, you know, and I find that people like that tend to be, you know, um, more, actually more empathetic towards others. You know, I, I like a man who's hard, can be hard on himself, but keep a sense of humor and uh, not not to, not show any cruelty. He might have to do in, in wartime violent things, but not not cruel, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, I, 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 you know, in other words, a soldier, a real soldier. You know, not so, not not yeah. not just a murdering thug. You know, when how was that installed? And you then to never quit at such a young age. Who did you get that from? I didn't get that. I, I that's one of the inner things you find out about yourself when you join. You don't know what's there until you find out. There's no way you just don't you don't know. And I talked to I remember a, a marine recon instructor, and I literally became one myself. And uh, I remember him saying to me, you know, this training isn't designed to get people to quit. It's designed to get quitters to quit. And they would tell you themselves, they'd watch guys coming in. They had no way. They could just never figure out who'd pass and who wouldn't. Mm -hmm. It's just, it's just, uh, it, it's an inner strength. You either got it, you don't. And you really don't know if you got it until it comes time to step up to the plate. You so know? you became a sergeant at 20 years old? Um, I, do, I was a sergeant at 21. Yeah, I made sergeant in three years. Yeah. That's young, no? That's very young. I had uh, several meritorious promotions. I did a lot of opportunities. They, first, they, they came to me, as, it's in the book, like they wanted me to learn Chinese. They, they told me from my entrance exams, I had a li high language aptitude. And then they talked to me about, you know, if you learn Chinese when you leave the Marines, or if, if you do leave, you can get into the CIA and the FBI. Like little do they know that I wanted to join the IRA. You know, if, they, <laughs> if they'd have known that, they'd, yeah. have, they'd have strung me up, you mm -hmm. know. But uh, I didn't want to make it a career. And then I got a chance when I was in advanced infantry training school, I was called out to uh, uh, an administration block and I had no idea why. It was a very unusual thing to happen. Excuse me. And there was a young naval officer there <clears throat> and he asked me would I go to the Naval Academy in Annapolis. Now, the Naval Academy in Annapolis, it usually takes um, a congressional recommendation or a state senator for you to go there. <clears throat> So they were offering me the opportunity of a lifetime uh, right there and then, but I had to sign away 10 years of my life. So they're they going to take, after empty training, they were going to put me into a nine-month prep school, four years at the academy. After two years in the academy, I could choose whether I wanted to be a commissioned officer in the Navy and the Marines, but then I had to give six years guaranteed service. So like 10 years right there and then. But I was determined, you know, to go home and join the IRA. Of course, I didn't tell them that, you know. Mm. Uh, but... Uh, if it wasn't for my Irish Republican ambitions, I probably would have jumped at that opportunity. That was like that was an opportunity not too many people got, you know. Yeah, like a James Bond type kind. It of. was uh, well, I wouldn't <laughs> say James Bond, but I would. But I mean, it was it was, um, you know, to bec become a commissioned officer from one of the most prestigious academies in the world. Mm -hmm. You know, it's you know, it's it's top notch stuff. Like you know, was the money good? I'd imagine it would have been. I I never did it, so yeah. I imagine it would have been very good. Yeah. So when you came back to Ireland, then how long did it take for you to join the IRA? Um. I'd say I'd say about ten months, 
for 10 it's months. pretty fast as well. Yeah, so yeah. Will you try to make waves when you come back to get attention? Or how does it work? No, <clears throat> I was trying not to get attention mm -hmm. because, I mean, it's supposed to be a secret army. I had no idea how to join. Like I said, uh, I even considered at one point maybe joining Sinn Féin, the political wing, and then maybe trying to get to know people that way. But then I thought, well, that's kind of stupid because if I do that, I'm known right away to the special branch and everything. So um, it took a bit of figuring out. But like I said, I, I eventually found out this guy worked in the building site and uh, building project. And I, I got in there and I approached him. Uh, had that not worked, I'm not too sure what I would have done because, uh, you know, Unlike the Marines, the IRA doesn't have recruiting offices. So, yeah. you know, but it, look, it was a test. I, I, I thought it was a, te a test of initiative and resolve. You know, I think I'd shown those qualities in recon. And uh, it's like anything else. If you really want to do something, you'll do it. Yeah. You'll do so it. you come back, you join the IRA. Like, yeah. what, is it, what does the troubles mean to you? Well, the troubles to me meant... Um, I look on, on the British claim to jurisdiction in Ireland as an act of war. I mean, the fact, you know, that they claim jurisdiction in Ireland to me is, you know, is they have no right to be in Ireland. And uh, so I looked at it as an act of war, as if if anybody, you know, invaded Britain and claimed jurisdiction a part of Britain, I'm sure they would look at it as an act of war, you know. Uh, but, you know, there was an ongoing fight uh, to resist that. I didn't... Um, <clears throat> But it's very important, you know, to put things in perspective. I didn't, I wanted to fight the Union, not Unionists. My war was with the, with the, the, the Union, uh, with Britain, not against Unionists. And I was never in a situation where I was involved in, you know, conflict with Loyalists or Unionists, like there would have been maybe in Belfast and places like that. I was never in a situation like that. And also, I didn't join the Provost to fight for the Provost. I, I joined the Provost to fight for the Irish Republic. Uh, for uh, to 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 build a um, thirty-two county uh, national democracy within an All Ireland Republic, and that that was my goal and, and the goal of most Republicans, and I thought the goal of our leadership. So why not the Unionists? Why were well, they not a target for you? <clears throat> well, first of all, I wouldn't have attacked Unionists for being Unionists. Yeah. I mean, but I mean, you mean like Unionist paramilitaries? Yeah. Well, because I, I wasn't in I wasn't in an area where that that was a that was a factor. Mm -hmm. I was mostly around the border in rural areas, things like that. That was really kind of a Belfast, you know, situation. Yeah. Uh, Mid Ulster, things like that. Yeah. So, what sort of training do you get then when you join the IRA? Uh, little to none, to be honest. Uh, most people were the training was very poor. Uh, Who saw? I kept hearing from, from the British that the IRA was this highly trained, highly professional force, right? <clears throat> but when I joined, e even uh, I found the, the basics. Uh, for example, you know, men might be brought down and, and shown how to f take a rifle apart, put it together, where to put the magazine and when end the bullet comes out. But they weren't, you know, I, they weren't shown things like how to adjust the sights for accuracy, uh, proper cleaning and lubrication of the weapon. Uh, immediate action drills for malfunctions, um, basic, basic infantry stuff, and no training that I ever saw in tactics, how to move, shoot, and communicate as a cohesive team, none of that. Um, the IRA uh, was w w was good at explosives, and th they had a very good engineering department, and they were able to manufacture uh, a wide array of improvised devices like mortars, uh, rocket launchers, things like that. And uh, they probably inflicted most of the casualties on the, on what we would consider the enemy than uh, gun attacks and things like that. Uh, also, I found that sometimes the training was counterproductive because sometimes people were told the wrong thing. For example, I heard men being told at camps that the British Army helmet was bulletproof to high velocity rifle fire, which it wasn't. And, you know, a, a lot of misconceptions like that. And I, I found it hard to um, to really understand why that was the case because the IRA was full of people who had professional military training. There was a lot of people in the IRA who'd been in the British Army. And I know people in the IRA who'd been in the, the Paris, had been in the in the Royal Marines. Uh, a lot of them had been in the Irish Army. So there was a pool of professional knowledge there. But for some reason, there was never a skills audit done to bring that together and to train people uh, to a high level. We had school teachers who could develop lesson plans, lesson plans and devise a course structure. We had artists who could, you know, devise uh, informative training aids. And, you know, a lot of stuff I saw 
was very easily resolved, I thought. But for some reason, it never seemed to be. Mm -hmm. Do you, you know? think that's because you were a recon in the Marines? You've seen a lot of the kind of not as ex not as, as strong and as tough as that, the, the young kid going in or somebody who thinks they're getting normal training, but you're just saying it's basic stuff. But do you think that's because you were in the Marines and you went to a high level of understanding how a true like, balance yeah. works? Well, n not really, because you see, the laws of physics don't don't change between a professional army and a guerrilla army. I mean, ballistics are ballistics, a trajectory is a trajectory, whether you're in Marine Recon or an untrained guerrilla fighter. You know, to be an accurate shot, to be, you know, to learn the marksmanship fundamentals, you have to have the basics. And, and they're very, very easily given to people. I mean, it's not rocket science learning this stuff, but I found it, um, I found the, the level of training quite poor. Uh, not to criticize training officers because many of them had no very little training themselves. Uh, a lot of them were doing a very thankless job under very difficult circumstances with very limited resources. I understood all that. Like I, I, I certainly didn't join the IRA like to be critical of them. Like I admired them. I looked up to them. You know, it's only when I was there for a while and I saw, you know, certain uh, weaknesses that could have been very easily fixed. You know, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, I started to you know make my views known. And then the next thing I know, I was told to go to America and buy guns because I had an American accent. So, and I remember thinking at the time, this is very strange because, well, you know, I'd been an instructor in a, in a special operations unit and I thought I had a lot more to offer the IRA than my accent, which at the time would have been, I'm sure my American accent there was much stronger back then, you know. And, uh, but no, I was... Uh, called to a meeting and told to go to uh, Boston and uh, set up a new arms network. But, you know, and it wasn't, you know, and I wasn't even told what to get, what to buy. Like, there was no strategy that I could see. You know, I was even, I, I was, um, let me see, what's the best way to put this? I was, uh, I was crestfallen for two reasons. One was that they seemed to think for all the knowledge resources I had, the only real asset that I could provide the IRA was my accent. And the other one was that I presume there was a strategy and they would tell me, you know, get this, get that, you know, so that we can carry out the strategy. But no, I was just told, go over there and get weapons. It was that vague, you know. I was given 9,000 Irish pounds, which is a derisory sum, and then sent off to Boston. Do you then question your decision-making then? Well, it wasn't my decision-making. My, or to join the IRA? Were you thinking you're maybe a bit more, in, not intelligent, but no. you wanted a wee bit more than just being used for your accent, basically? No, well, I certainly didn't think I was more intelligent. I mean, they, mm. they were very intelligent guys. No, with the training that you'd already done, like you're obviously, yeah. uh, you've gave up a, a life yeah. a, a, of a great opp jobs yeah. opportunities to then join the IRA. Like, yeah. Were you expecting more? Well, I was expecting to contribute more mm -hmm. than my accent. How old were you then? I'd have been, uh, about 23. 23, 24. Well, oh, by the time I went to the States, sorry, about closer to 25. And you were just happy to go there? and Well, I wasn't happy to go there, but mm -hmm. I, I was told to go, so I went. I, I was more or less given the option, you know, if I wanted to stay in the IRA to go. You know, and you see, the IRA is very, very compartmental. Like, car, well, um, yeah. I usually can pronounce that word, but you know what I'm saying. Yeah. And the thing about it is um, uh, you, you, you didn't, you tended not to second guess people, you know, you just kind of hope there was a reason, there was a good reason that you couldn't see, you know? Mm -hmm. And uh, so I just, I followed orders and I went. And uh, when I got to Boston, then I met, um, I was given half of, uh, half a $5 note that was caught in a very erratic way. And I was told that my contact over there had the other half of this $5 note. So when I got there, I met the person and I told them that, you know, we're going to need driver's licenses to buy guns, fake driver's licenses and other uh, resources. So that's when I first met James Whitey Bulger, the notorious, you know, gangster. But he wasn't notorious then. He wasn't notorious to me. I, I, I'd never met him. I didn't know who he was. Uh, excuse me. And um, so I met him and uh, he... Uh, he gave us a few guns and he gave us a little money, $5,000, something like that. It wasn't much. And, uh, but one of his men there, uh, Patney, who was originally from Ireland, was a, grew up in an Irish speaking house. His parents spoke fluent Irish at home. Uh, he'd been an ex Marine and we kind of clicked. We hit it off. And Pat was very enthusiastic about helping us. And 
so Whitey sort of gave the nod, but he wasn't really hands-on Whitey like Patney was, you know. Patney did did almost, you know, the real work in, you know, in expanding the operation to where we ended up with seven and a half tons of weapons and tens of thousands of rounds of ammunition, you know. Mm -hmm. But um, then uh, after some time, uh, but I have to emphasize about Whitey, you know, the, the Whitey thing was with all the books about him and all the movies about him and things like that now, and some of the nefarious activities he was at, like, we didn't know that. We knew he was a criminal, obviously, because he was able to, you know, break the law, get fake licenses, get guns. But we didn't know, like, the things he was doing that we later learned, you know, murdering people, pulling their teeth out, burying them in the basement, things like that. You know, obviously, he wasn't going to tell us that stuff, you know. But, uh, so... But was he scared of him? Um, he was intimidating, in a way. But he he tried to um, build a rapport with me and other IRA guys. Uh, but at the same time, he had a sort of... Uh, barrier put up. You couldn't get too close. You couldn't get too friendly to him. Uh, I remember a couple of times maybe engaging in a bit of banter, a bit of friendly banter, and he sort of pushed back a bit, you know, as if maybe you weren't respecting him, you know. I think he wanted you always a little bit in awe of him. I wasn't in awe of this guy, you know, but you sort of had to play the game a little bit, you know. Uh, you know, a lot of these people, they have enormous egos, enormous egos, like off the charts, and he certainly had, you know. And, uh, you know, if you want to get stuff done, if you want to get work done, if you want uh, him to cooperate and provide resources, sometimes you just got to toe the line a little bit and, you know, say, oh, that's great, Jim, and Jim, that's a great idea, and, you know, this type of stuff. Mm -hmm. Kiss his ass if it had to, you know. Mm -hmm. It was for Ireland. Uh, <laughs> I had to do it for Ireland. How long were you in America for doing that? Well, off and on. I, I'd be going back and forth off and on. I was there at one stage for three months. And then I'd be back in Ireland for a while. And then I was back a couple of other months. And the longest time I was there was for nine months, right? But you see, we had, we were actually planning a much bigger operation, much bigger arms operation. And uh, there was a fellow down in New York, Liam Ryan, God rest him. He was later murdered by a uh, loyalist working on behalf of IEC Special Branch. And he went to Ireland and he met several members of the area leadership. And he came back with a note for me, a, a calm, we, a, a communication, we call it a calm. And I opened it and it said that I was to ring a phone booth in, in Dublin at a certain time on a certain day to receive instructions, which was quite unusual. We didn't use phones in that manner. Of course, there was no mobile phones or anything like that back then. But anyway, I, I did what I was told and I rang the number. I didn't recognize the voice on the other end. I had no idea who it was, but I knew he was somebody working on behalf of somebody in the area leadership. And he told me to come home now with everything you got and you be on the boat. And I remember he was very emphatic, you be on the boat, which I thought was very strange because I was never supposed to be on the boat in the first place because I had all the contacts. I had set up the network mm -hmm. uh, and we were, you know, uh, operating uh, on other projects to get, you know, heavier weapons and things like that. I wasn't afraid to be on the boat, nothing like that, but it was. I thought it was a very unusual order. But anyway, I then went to um, Patney and a couple of other the Boston guys over there and said, look, I just got an order. I, I got to go home now. With Thinking about it after, I, I, why didn't they just tell me to fly home and just tell me what was going on? But no, come now on the boat. But anyway, so what they did then is uh, we had been preparing a much bigger boat called the Surge, like the steel freighter. It's a big job, a lot of work, you know. So we had to go to a guy called Bob Anderson. Well, they went to him. I, I, I didn't know who this guy was. He was a fisherman. They offered him $10,000 to, you know, to use his fishing boat to take whatever guns we had across the Atlantic. And uh, so he was offered 10000 and so other in, other inducements like, you know, they were going to buy thousands of dollars worth of bait and things like that. He could sword fish on the way home and make tens of thousands of dollars from that and keep all the profit. Uh, and there was another guy called John McIntyre, who was later murdered by Whitey Bulger. Uh, he was given ten thousand dollars to you know to man the boat, and he was a bit of a jack of all trades, a fisherman, and he knew his way around the boats. Uh, even though I'd been in the Marines, I mean, I was I was no fisherman, I was no sailor, so I was kind of dead weight on the boat, you know. But uh, anyway, we gathered everything up. We were given coordinates where to meet an Irish boat off the coast of Ireland. Uh, we left in in September, in the middle of September, nineteen eighty four. 
with about seven tons of weapons on board on this fishing boat that wasn't even supposed to cross the Atlantic. You know, it was a crazy stunt, like, you know, and uh, we took off and uh, about halfway across the Atlantic, we hit a storm, a hurricane. It was actually a hurricane. And uh, I remember Bob Anderson, the captain, telling me that he'd been monitoring it on uh, coming up the Gulf Stream. And I remember thinking, you know, this is all we need now, you know. But when it hit, it was absolutely horrendous. It did tremendous damage to the boat, knocked out four of the seven tempered glass windows. Uh, we very, very nearly sank. I remember at one point asking Bob, should we put on the survival suits we brought along with us? And he said that um, we're, we, our communications have been knocked out because when water came in, the broken windows, it knocked out our radios and our navigation. So he says, we're in the middle of the Atlantic. We have no communications. Uh, nobody knows we're here. Put it on if you want, but it's just going to take you eight hours longer to die. So none of us put them on, you know? So that was a really hairy situation. I just thought we were just goners. But Anderson, you know, thanks to his uh, 25 years fishing in the North Atlantic and his skills as a boatman, he, he got us out of it, but it was real touch and go. I didn't think we were going to survive. Uh, we managed to limp our way on then to meet another boat called the Marina Anne about 200 miles off the coast of Ireland. Uh, we were given a longitude and longitude where to be. They were there a certain day in time. We transferred the weapons. And on our way in to Kenmare Bay to land the guns, we were stopped by the Irish Navy and arrested. And uh, we were brought to uh, Cork, interrogated, uh, charged, and then sentenced to 10 years in prison for that. You know, We were informed on... Uh, it later turned out that there was a senior IRA man called Sean O'Callaghan, who was a guard, a police, Irish police, and MI5 agent. And he told them that we were coming. Uh, but the thing that I wonder about to this day is um, he, told on our, he told on our location, but he wasn't the one who said, come now, bring everything, and you be on the boat. And to this day, I don't know who gave that order. So you don't know who phoned you? I have no idea. No, and because have, Liam Ryan, have, who gave me the message, was, was murdered afterwards. Could it have been police? No, it was I, It was somebody, it was, I believe it was somebody high up in the area leadership. An informant? Absolutely, yes, I believe that. Because it, it, it was it was made no sense. It, it, it screwed up everything. We were planning a much bigger operation. We were supposed to bring weapons from Libya. Uh, we had a freighter lined up for that. It, everything went down the tubes to bring over a bunch of basic Basic, basically junk that would have made no difference whatsoever to the IRA campaign. I swear to God, you know. Mm. So it's it's one of the mysteries of my life. Who gave me that order and why? Do you still get sleepless nights over that? Not sleepless, but I, the hardly a day goes by when I don't think about it, you know. So it's just... Uh, O'Callaghan told us, uh, you know, coming into Kenmare Bay, but he didn't. He wasn't the one that gave that order. Mm -hmm. Um <clears throat> After we were arrested, of course, the IRA set up an investigation and how we were arrested. And, uh, you know, the initial suspicion would have come on a mistake I made because I was told before I left that only six or seven men in Ireland knew about this operation. So if it went, you know, pear-shaped, it had to be me for either trusting the wrong person or doing the wrong thing. It's basically told that, right? So I was getting messages in, you know, asking me, what did you do? Who did you talk to? And all this, the implication being it was our end. And I, I remember thinking, now, hold on a wee second, right? We were given a lo longitude and latitude where to be in the Atlantic. But I didn't know we were going to Kenmare Bay. I had no idea the boat coming out to meet us was the Marita Anne. I didn't know anybody on the Marita Anne. I didn't know where the boat in Ireland was based. We could have been going to Donegal, Sligo, Waterford, anywhere. No idea. Nobody in the American then knew either. But the Irish Navy knew, and they were waiting for us, and I know I didn't tell them. Mm -hmm. Now, we learned later that Sean O'Callaghan told them that we were coming to Kenmare Bay. But like, he wasn't the one that told them, you know, he wasn't the one that told me to come now, bring everything and you be on the boat. Mm -hmm. So it's one of the mysteries of my life, you know. Where were you getting the weapons from? Well, mostly gun stores. You know, we were uh, we were going around buying weapons. Um, there was some IRA weapons over there that, from previous uh, purchases that were, were there. Liam Ryan, like I said, my friend who was later killed, had some stuff stored, he gave it to us. And then Whitey Bulger had some stuff. But it was mostly, it, it, it wasn't, um, see, my goal was to standardize the weaponry, uh, standard military weaponry that would, you know, uh, smooth our logistical problems. Like, for example, you know, you could have, um, you could have uh, eight IRA volunteers in operation. Everybody with a different rifle, 
everybody with a different caliber. You know, it was a logistical nightmare and a training nightmare, you know. So standardizing that was, uh, I thought, an important step. Uh, but the stuff in the Marine Anne was, you know, some of, you know, there was some good stuff on it, but it was mostly just basic infantry stuff, a lot of stuff thrown together, stuff we'd got from Weddy Bulger, things like that, you know, a mishmash. But uh, bottom line, it would have made no difference whatsoever to the IRA campaign if that had got in. None. Yeah, but seven and a half tons is still a lot of weapons. It's a lot of weapons, but it would have made no difference to the IRA campaign. It wouldn't because uh, the IRA already had rifles and stuff like that, you know. And, mm -hmm. and I think what the IRA needed more than weapons was proper training on the weapons they had and, you know, better tactics and things like that, you know. What sort of stuff were you going to do bigger before that well, shipment? Well, we, in the States, we were, we were, um, we ha we were just making progress on getting fifty caliber sniping rifles, you know, that would penetrate the jackets and the armor here in in, in the north, and uh, we were we were working on um, uh, the Libyan uh, shipment, which no secret now. I mean, stuff came in from Libya and died in the mid eighties. That I'm not talking out of school here; it's public knowledge. Now, when I say we we're working on it, I wasn't working on. The, I I was. Uh, we were only supposed to transport it. But I, I, I had written a list to a member of the area leadership on stuff to get. And one of them was like one of six recorders rifles, which I'd used in the Marines, which is a cannon, you know, and it turned out uh, three shiploads of weapons came in from Libya uh, with thousands of weapons. I mean, huge, a huge arsenal, the, the likes of which the IRA had never seen before. And, uh, but the real heavy stuff, the 106s, the 81 millimeter mortars, the real heavy infantry stuff was on another boat called the Exxon, which was, was caught in November 1987. So the real heavy stuff didn't come in, but still the IRA now had the capacity to fight an enhanced war of national liberation if it chose to do so. You need you need three things to have any hope of success in fighting a, a war. You need the skill, the capacity, and the motivation. You need the motivation. In the early 80s, the IRA certainly had that. You know, you know look at the hunger strikers and, and things like that. Highly motivated uh, organization. Uh, we were lacking in skill, but we, we could provide the skill. But capacity was the uh, the most glaring uh, shortfall. You know, the the weaponry w that we needed to pursue the struggle. By the mid '80s, we had all we had the capacity. You know, and uh, it's around that time that that um, the IRA seemed to pull back from the brink, so to speak, and started putting out peace feelers. You know, when when I when I when I felt that we had the capacity. Well, I was in jail anyway. I was hearing a lot of the stuff in jail. But, you know, when we finally had the capacity maybe to push things to where we could get to the negotiating table with the Irish Republic on the negotiating table instead of, um, uh, when, I, when I say the Irish Republic, I mean a 32-county, all Ireland democracy. So what are you thinking then when you get a 10-stretch? Like, you're thinking that obviously it's a setup, but did you know then you were set up straight away or did it take a bit of time? No, I, I knew we were set up straight away because they were waiting on us. So they were clearly set up. And, uh, but I had no idea who at the time, you know. Uh, so, you know, many Irish Republican projects in history, you know, since 1798, back to the Fenian times, throughout our history, it, it almost always seems to be scuppered by informers. Yeah. I mean, Brit the British are extremely, very, are really good at infiltrating organizations and getting in there. I mean, you know, the British state, you know, they're the fifth, sixth largest economy in the world. They have unlimited resources, uh, uh, enough money to buy almost anybody. You know what I mean? They're, they're, they're good at it. Like, you know, they're really good at it, you know? One English academic, I can't remember his name, but he said not in, 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 in recently that of 196 countries in the world, the British have invaded or had a military presence at some stage in 171 of them. So they're absolute experts at, um, you know, at, at counterinsurgency, at co-opting leaderships, you know, you know, to dovetail with their own strategies and things like that. Um, uh, I certainly would never underestimate, you know, the British when it comes to being able to, um, you know, uh, uh, take on a, a, an insurgency. They're, they're, they're very good at it. You know, they, they've experienced from, you know, from their empire around the world. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So where did you do your 10 years? I did my 10 years in Port Leash Prison in, in, in the south of Ireland. I got 10 years for the uh, arms. We were on an escape attempt in 1985. 12 of us made a break for freedom. There was 14 gates. We got through 13 of them. And the, uh, the, the explosives we put on the last gate actually buckled the gate 
and uh, the second charge we put on to blow it out uh, didn't go, unfortunately. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. How did you get the explosives into prison? Well, I, I, I couldn't. You know mm -hmm. that that's that's a secret has to remain. You know uh -huh. to, pr to protect the guilty. <laughs> mm -hmm. So but, uh, you get through thirteen gates. We got thirteen gates. We got through fourteen of them. Yeah, we had we had keys and everything. We had screws, uniforms. We had it was an ingenious escape attempt. We had um, see the, the Irish army were on the roof and they were told to shoot anybody not in a screws uniform running across. But we had lycra. Uh, sewn up lycra and uh, and if you put on a sports jacket and you put it over uh, the sports jacket, it looked like a screws. We had wooden buttons and a little paper uh, tie. Now for me to you, it was bullshit. But for the guy on the roof in the tower, he couldn't quite make out. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So when we were running across the yard. That's the only thing that saved, saved our lives from being riddled mm -hmm. by them, you know? But uh, no, it was, it, was, it was a good attempt. Uh, yeah, I, I, I suppose that was 1985 and I think probably my well, I have a lot of regrets, I mean, from losing friends and things, but, but I think my greatest personal regret as an IRA volunteer was that escape didn't work because mm -hmm. I was 28 uh, and, uh, uh, you know, I'd only been a year in prison and we'd have got out, you know, at, at the height of things, you know what I mean? And, you know, you don't want to be sitting in prison when you're a motivated young fella. You know, you want to, and you, you're motivated to fight for your country. You, you, you want to be out there doing the business, you know? Mm -hmm. So, you know... So I got three year, extra years for that. So we, with the two remissions, I, I I ended up doing a full 10. So I, I went into jail in September 84, and I came out in September 94. So the full 10 stretch? Full 10. Obviously, yeah. Sam Muller, the, the blanket man in uh, Long Cash, H Blocks, that was a tough, tough, tough beatings every day, tortured every day. Like, how was your treatment? And It wasn't nearly as bad. It wasn't nearly as bad. We had strip searching and, the, and there were beatings at, and things from time to time, but it wasn't systematic like Sam Miller and them boys got, you know, uh, Richard O'Raw, uh, people like that. Um, uh, I, I don't know how they uh, got through it really, because even like, you know, I talk about the special forces training, you know, six weeks of hell. That, some of those guys had six years of it every yeah. day. You know, it, 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 it you know, uh, it took a special type of of man to survive that because you see they could leave the blanket any time just say i'm leaving i'm going and and you know they would have been taken right off put in, in, into a uniform and be given just normal treatment mm -hmm. at any time you can click your fingers and leave the torture plus they were getting uh losing remission every day so some of them were a actually adding years to their sentences they didn't need to do yeah. so i mean the bravery of those men and the commitment and the sheer heroism because you know you know, sometimes people forget because, you know, I know, you know, uh, you know, British and Unionists and that, you know, the IRA just a bunch of terrorists, this and that. I, you know, I could write the script. I know what people think. But there was there was such heroism as well, such commitment. And uh, I get, you know, annoyed, you know, at being informed on and things like that. But, you know, looking around me, the vast majority of people were terrific. And I could not have spent a lifetime in the movement uh uh, spent all the years in prison, got out, went back in active service. I couldn't have done that unless I was inspired by what I was fighting for and inspired by the people around me. Mm -hmm. See, when I talk about lack of training and all, I don't want to come across as, you know, people were, were you know, stupid or something. They weren't, you know. I mean, if you put me in a space shuttle, I, I wouldn't know how to fly it. Does that, does that mean I'm stupid? It just means I'm not trained. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. uh, that, with a better leadership, with a, with a more focused leadership, I believe, uh, and with the caliber of people we had, I believe we could have uh, got to a much stronger negotiating position than we did when it finally did come to negotiations, mm -hmm. you know. What was it like being in prison when the hunger strike was taking place? Well, I wasn't in prison then. Probably I was not. outside then, yeah. I was at Bobby Sands' funeral. In fact, by pure coincidence, I mean, it's just pure coincidence. I, I can actually see my, when the firing party is shooting over us, Cough, and I can see myself in the crowd there, right behind the firing party. I mean, I didn't know they were coming out there. I had no idea. Pure coincidence. Mm -hmm. But uh, I was actually there that day. It was the most uh, unbelievable. There must have been about 150,000 people at it. I mean, it, that struck a chord in Irish people. It was unbelievable. Uh, but, you know, we talk about how bad the blocks were. To have to die like that, to starve yourself to death. You know, to be honest with you, I don't like missing breakfast. You know what I mean? <laughs> I don't, you know, I don't, I like my grub. Anybody mm -hmm. who knows me knows that. I like mm -hmm. my grub, you know. But uh, to go on a hunger strike and, and to do that and the commitment he had, you know. And the thing about it is, 
uh, it's an interesting thing. You know, uh, we're told today that we were fighting for a united Ireland, but you know, Ireland was united for most of its history. It's only partitioned for a hundred years. Uh, we were the Irish Republican Army, not the United Ireland Army. And I think Bobby Sands understood that very well because uh, when he won in hunger strike, he wrote a message that was later made public and it said, what's lost here is lost for the Republic. And uh, when he was in a prison mass later on, he passed a message to one of his friends in the mass. And the message said, among other things, tell the boys the Republic is safe with me. Mm -hmm. He didn't didn't say United Ireland. He said the Republic. Mm -hmm. You know. See when they went on the first hunger strike, like Bobby Sands and that. Did she not sign the agreement to say that everything was fine? They were going to give them their normal clothes, and um, but then she took it back straight but away. Th that, that's my understanding. I, I don't know all the ins and outs because I wasn't involved in those negotiations. Yeah. Uh, somebody who would know uh, a lot I think about Sam Miller uh, says a lot that. Of Sam Miller, Richard O'Raw too. R mm -hmm. Richard O'Raw actually, he was instrumental in getting getting my book to the publishers. Mm -hmm. uh, Belfast lad, he wrote On the Blanket. It's all about that stuff. And uh, he, he's written several books since. And Richard Rowe had a very comprehensive knowledge of that time. But it is my understanding that there was, the, 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 the Brits reneged, mm -hmm. you know, uh, which is a, a, a surprise. Yeah. <laughs> when we say the Brits, you know, I gotta make something clear, James. Um, uh, when we talk about the Brits, really, we're talking about England. You know, England is 85% of the population in the UK. It's 86% something of its gross domestic product. I mean, you know, the, the Scottish and the Welsh aren't really an issue. You know, it was it, it, it's England. I, I, we say Brits, but it's really England. England, uh, English politicians are the most uh, bloodthirsty in dealing with the IRA and the most uh, strident in, in trying to maintain a constitutional link with Ireland in some way, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? How was it at Bobby Sands' funeral? Did that fuel you to keep going? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. And it, 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 it like was- that changed history? That was a game it changed, changer? It changed history. It changed history in, in a lot of ways. But um, uh, I think, you know, it, it, it was a powerful historical moment. Uh, but it was also a very frustrating time because again, uh, we didn't have the capacity to hit back to the, in, the, in the way we would have liked to hit back against the, the British. Uh, so it was, it was frustrating too, you know, people wanted to, you know, you, you, you don't fight a war for revenge, that's, that's crazy. But, um, you know, you, you fight a war to achieve certain political goals. But there's no, there's no question that young fellas at a time like that want to hit back, to, they're motivated to, uh, to strike back at the enemy. And, you know, there really wasn't the capacity at the time to do that, mm -hmm. you know. That yeah, but so that was frustrating as an IRA volunteer. But uh, you know, I was there. I was there as an IRA volunteer. I was in active service at the yeah. time, and uh, it was it was it was heartbreaking. And then you know, nine more men died after that, and uh, so ten hunger strikers died in the blocks. And we have to bear in mind that two hunger strikers died in England. You know, Michael Gohan and Frank Stagg uh, at a different time. So you know, uh, you know. I remember, you know, going around bases in America and you'd see a base named after some guy who won the Medal of Honor in Vietnam, Korea, World War II. And very often uh, it was one for some act of heroism that might have been um, an impulsive act, not taken away from it, maybe jumping on a grenade to save your friends or charging a machine gun, whatever, right? But an impulsive act in the heat of combat. But these guys refused three meals a day, every day for two months, up to two months and more. I think Bobby Sands survived for 72 days. And they would lovely, tasty meals, better meals than ever you would normally get in the cell with them. And basically those men refused life three times a day, week after week for up to two months. You know, I, I don't know many acts of heroism anywhere like that, mm -hmm. you know. So uh, we had very inspiring people. And it, and of course, it wasn't just the hunger strikers. I mean, I, I've seen things that'll never be made public that IRA guys done next to service that would have won the Medal of Honor, the Victoria Cross in any other army. But, you know, it's all lost to history. They'll never be known because we were a secret army and these things couldn't be made public. But, uh, you know, I saw enormous acts of heroism. And on the other hand, too, you, you, you had people in the area who shouldn't have been there, you know, mm -hmm. waste of space, complete, yeah. utter waste of space. Uh, but, uh, 
you know, I, I'd served in, like like I said, the Marines, Special Forces. I worked with SEAL Team. I, you know, we were based with SEAL Team too. I worked with the American Green Berets. You know, I got to understand the Special Forces caliber and the Special Forces mindset. And in a in in a in, in, in a number of area volunteers, I saw the same caliber, the same quality. You know, with the right uh, leadership and the right um, uh, resources and direction, uh, th they would have been as good as any any soldier on, in the world. You know, yeah. you know, and that keeps you going. That inspires. That inspired me anyway. How hard is it to lose brothers? It was very tough, you know. And uh, how do you deal with that? Um, Does that fuel you with vengeance? Or are you trying to? Do you forget then what you're fighting for? No, I don't think so. Um, I, I I had a number number of friends killed. Uh, I remember. Um, I remember one SCS ambush. Uh, there were three volunteers killed, and uh, I knew Pete Ryan was one of them very well from from jail. Uh, and uh, Lawrence McNally, uh, he had been helping me buy guns in the states, and we actually lived in a flat together for about four or five months. So we we're real close, really good mates, you know. And I knew I knew a good few fellas killed uh, over the years. Um, guys I was in jail with, guys I had, you know, guys you slept in the same bed with, and things like that, and houses and that, you know. Uh, by the way, don't, <laughs> don't you know, yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, slept, <laughs> you know, and, uh, uh, yeah. Um, no, I tell you what, a, a feeling of loss and a feeling of pride, but never really a feeling of, of revenge because, you know, even a lot of the fellows who were killed, you know, you know, sometimes propaganda would say these guys were murdered by the Brits. The, the, they would prefer to say they were killed in action. They were fighting for their country and they were killed in action. They volunteered to do it and they went in, you know, knowing what they were at. And, you know, if they paid the price, you know, they paid it willingly. Mm -hmm. You know, nobody wants to die, but, you know, I mean, the thing about the IRA is, uh, you know, if you don't want to go to jail and you don't want to get killed, don't, don't, don't fucking join the IRA. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a good first step. Yeah. You know what I mean? How hard was it to see Irish calling Irish as well, though? Well, uh, that is where, that is how the British, uh, uh, that's how a small country like Britain conquered half the world. They get one side to kill the other side. You know, they're master manipulators. And it, it, it's it's very hard because um, it only works to the benefit of the enemy. It only works to the benefit of the British when Irish are killing Irish. It doesn't work to any, you know, it doesn't work to any Irish benefit, you know. Uh, but, um, I think I think it's important um, when you're involved in something like that to try to look at the big picture and to see who the real enemy is. And the real enemy was, as far as I, I was concerned, a British strategy in Ireland. If you focus too much on your real enemy is the loyalist or the unionist or the guy, because, you know, everything's parochial and uh, uh, things could get too parochial and you get tied up in, in sort of maybe an almost tribal thing. You know what I mean? Uh, and it's easy to see why that would happen. I mean, you know, people often wonder, you know, why did uh, why did the Indians not get together and you know fight the white men of the West? I mean, the Indians were working for the cavalry here, killing each other. And see that tribal thing, that tribal stuff that you, you have you have that everywhere. You know, you have that everywhere, and and uh, uh, a, a power like Britain exploits that. You know, exploits it. But they sort of created the tribes in the first place because Ireland was just was. Uh, was a separate country with a separate language and a separate culture. And uh, they planted Ulster as an act of ethnic cleansing, uh, bringing Scottish and, you know, uh, most, mostly Scottish and English uh, uh, planters in there to, uh, to um, turn Ulster, which at that time was the toughest nut for England to crack into what, uh, an area that would become like... Um, a dagger aimed at almost aimed at the heart of a national cohesion. What also unionists now, you know, saying that they don't want to unite Ireland, they don't want to live in a, an all Ireland republic. This, this this division, this this thing is baked in. You know what I mean? And uh, but it was it was planted by the British. It was uh, it was designed to be that way. If you read what they were saying at the time of the plantations, they were open about it. You know, we're going to make Ireland English, or we're going to make Ireland British, and even the um, Edmund Spencer, the famous uh, English uh, planter uh, in Elizabethan times, you know, said that the Irishman, well in time, quite learned to forget his Irish nation. Mm 
mm-hmm. and that was the plan to wipe out the Irish nation. So, see, after your ten years in prison, was it just straight out and back to normal duties? With the IRA? Yeah. Yeah, well, you know, there was a ceasefire. You see, what happened was the ceasefire came in on the 31st of August, 1994, the first ceasefire. So I got out on the, I think, the 10th of September. So I actually got out 10 days after the ceasefire. And a lot of people at the time thought I got out because of the ceasefire. And I was saying, I, I did all my, I did every day of my time, you know. And uh, so, you know, things were in a state of flux. We didn't know really what was happening. I think the question was... Uh, were we were we uh, running rings around the Brits? Were the Brit, Brits running rings around us? We didn't know, and because the IRA was so, um, uh, you know, you never really saw the big picture. It, it was all, car, car, you know, uh, compartmentalized. Oh my God, why can't I pronounce that word anymore? But uh, uh, I think the only people who really had the big picture, in fact, I know the only people who had the big picture was British intelligence. They had the big picture, you know. And they were able to, um, I was talking to a journalist one time, uh, I won't say who he was, but he was telling me that he was talking to a member of the FRU, the Force Research Unit, the uh, British Army's military intelligence. And he said, the, the way that they used to work would be, it'd be like, say you're an IRA man and I'm a UVF man. We're at the table here playing chess, right? Turn out the lights, right? There's the chess pieces there, turn out the lights. But the FRU man is there with his night vision goggles on. He comes in, he changes all the pieces around. Then they put the lights back on. You know what I mean? And it's a mess. You know what I mean? And that's what they do. They they manipulate and uh, they take out this person, they take out that person because they want to get this person up, up. you know. They got to kill the right people, buy the right people, jail the right people, you know, to get where they're going. But um, when, when you get out after your 10, where did, did you straight back to business? Uh, well, because there was a ceasefire on, not, yeah. Y- yeah, I volunteered immediately. But mm-hmm. well, they told me take a break for a while, and you know, you just been in 10 years. Yeah. And, you know, they do that in any way. They don't like people to, um, to, uh, they, you need, you need to, you need to sell your head a bit and take mm-hmm. a bit of a break. But I was more or less back, back at business fairly quickly. We were, uh, planning at that stage maybe operation not not maybe we were planning an operation in england at that stage to uh knock out the um or to disrupt the power supply to the south south east of england for a period of time uh the thinking behind it was that uh there had been two bombs in the city of london at bishopsgate and at um baltic exchange and those two bombs caused more financial damage to the British economy than the 10,000 explosions in the whole course of the Troubles. And so they set up a ring of steel around the city of London and f- over 1,500 cameras, nearly impossible to penetrate. So, you know, uh, we kind of came to the conclusion then that if you were um, in Bonn or Frankfurt or Tokyo or Wall Street and you were phoning somebody in the city of London, you don't care if he's in a palatial office or a tent. All you care about, can he answer the phone and can he use the computer? And you can't do that without electricity, you know. So we came up with a, a plan to um, uh, disrupt the electricity in the south of England for a period of time. Uh, we weren't sure how long it would take because we weren't sure how long it would take the British to, to respond to it. But uh, we were uh, caught then in London. Again, I believe we were informed on, again. And uh, we... Uh, Ended up getting 35 years in prison for that. And um, about uh, several weeks after we were convicted, I was approached by uh, a prison officer who said the two Americans wanted to see me from the American embassy. And uh, um, I said, well, I'm... I'm Irish and I have an Irish passport. I have nothing against the United States, no problem with the Americans. But, you know, if I... Uh, have an have a, a consular issue i'll deal with the irish embassy so the prison officer went away came back about an hour later and said uh they said you will want to see them you will want to see them so i thought oh you know what's this about i started thinking is this a legal issue something to do with the whitey bulger case maybe that they're going to extradite me to the states over that over whitey bulger or something to do with whitey bulger and then I was thinking, well, that doesn't make sense because I just got 35 years a few weeks ago. So, th- And then I thought, are they going to tell me, well, after your 35 years are up, you're coming back over, you know? Mm-hmm. I had no idea. So there were two other prisoners, two other IRA prisoners there. And I approached them. I says, you know, 
I want to find out what's going on here, but if you don't think it's appropriate, I won't go. And they says, no, no, find out, find out what they want, right? So I went out to this visiting box and uh, it was kind of like this, you know, there's, there was a man and a woman seated across kind of where you are, James. I was here and uh, the woman uh, had a face in her like a slap darse. She'd have probably burned me at the stake. I could tell right away her hostility was just pouring out of every every pore of her body, right? The other guy there was a very distinguished looking guy, crumpy coat, but an amiable, you know, friendly uh, demeanor. So the, the woman spoke first and she said, uh, you know, how are you being treated here? I said, great. Everything's great. Uh, what's the food like? Best food I ever ate in prison. Best ever. And uh, are you getting reading materials and stuff like that? I said, yeah, there's plenty to read. See, I knew what she was getting at. She wanted me to be whinging and whining and begging, you know, to get me out of here in some way. So I knew that. Like, So I started letting on, like I said in the book, that I just got a 35-year ticket to the Playboy Mansion. Now, I mean, I hated every minute of it. It was a nightmare. It was, it was like, a, it was just, you're like, it's like you're buried alive in this place, this special secure unit. Hated it. But I wasn't going to start, you know, uh, you know, crying and whining and looking deals. That wasn't just wasn't going to happen. So then uh, she says, oh, you certainly don't got a lot to complain about. And then, then she was quiet. Then the other guy, big smile, handshake. He says, John, I'm with a different agency. As soon as he said that, I knew it was CIA. And as soon as I realized that, I knew what was common, a sales pitch, right? So he says, John, I've been following your career with some interest. And I said, oh, right. And uh, he says, John, you know, we can leave the visiting box right now. He says, you don't even have to go back inside. We can walk out right now. He says, we'll have you on a plane for America tomorrow morning. He says, and we'll give you a lot of money. And then he kind of leaned forward and he says, John, a lot of money. He says, all you got to do is tell the, the, the security forces here where the explosives are hidden. And I says, uh, are you aware I've already done 10 years in prison? He says, yes. And I says, well, then you'll be aware. I says, I've been in prison before. I know what's facing me. I says, I'm not going to become the hard man now begging to see you in a year's time. I says, uh, I'm not going to betray my country. I'm not going to betray my comrades. You know, uh, it's just not going to happen. So uh, they actually got up to leave. And then he, uh, as he was leaving, I said, uh, you shook my hand coming in here. Will you not shake it now? So he turned around and magnanimously took my hand, you know, shook my hand. And I says, maybe we'll meet up in 35 years and we'll swap a few war stories. And he goes, oh, maybe we will, he says, you know. And then uh, I says, I'll tell you what, I says, I'll do you a favor. I says, I'll tell you how to defeat the IRA. I says, you tell your British friends to leave Ireland and allow us to build a national democracy without any further interference from the British and our internal affairs. And I says, and I guarantee you the IRA will dis disappear overnight. And I says, I'll tell you another thing too. I says, I'm not charging you a penny for that information. <laughs> so he just smiled and he left, you know. So I went in, back in, and I reported it to the boys, the approach. I phoned the prisoner's department in Dublin, told them of the attempt to recruit me, and I phoned my solicitor, Mike Fisher, who I only recently learned has since died, and I'm sorry, lovely, lovely man, and told him of the approach to, uh, of the attempt to uh, recruit me as an informer. And the next day, the IRA called the second ceasefire. And then I realized why they were in a panic to see me that day. Because when I went out, to see them. I knew nothing about another ceasefire coming up. As far as I knew, I was there for 35 years. I had no reason or evidence whatsoever to believe otherwise, right? And uh, they knew they had to get me, they had to get me, you know, <laughs> that day or they weren't getting me, you know? So, so you could have basically, because you got out in a Good Friday Agreement, 1998? I, I, I eventually did, yeah. But I didn't know that at the time. I didn't yeah. know we were getting out. So they tried to set you up? Well, they tried to recruit me when they thought I when when they knew I knew I was doing thirty five years. Yeah. You know what I mean. But that shows you the caliber of man you are, not to turn snitch like majority of people do. That like, did you did you did you struggle with that as time went on? You realised there was a few informants working for the IRA. Oh, of course. Oh, of course. The IRA had a lot of informants and at a very high level too, at a very high level. But um, the vast majority of people were sound people who 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 you know made tremendous sacrifices. And, you know, you, you have to sacrifice a lot in the IRA. You have to sacrifice so much uh, normality. Um, uh, it, it, it's a life of poverty. You know, I mean, you never have money. It's it's dangerous. You, you know, you never know. I mean, I mean, when I was out, I remember every Christmas, I'd, my Christmas dinner, I'd always think, well, I'd be dead or in prison this time next year, you know? And, uh, well, eventually I was in prison, you know? And then, but... Um, <clears throat> So while, you know, you know, there were people betraying us, um, 
the vast majority of people were sound, you know. But the trouble is, in a small organization like ours, it takes very few people to do a lot of damage if they're the wrong type of people, you know what I mean? And uh, But the Brits, you know, they're, they're good. They're good at it, you know, and they have unlimited resources, unlimited time. You see, the British intelligence guy, he's sitting back. He's on a wage. He's on a pension. You know, he's got all the time in the world. You're an IRA guy. You got no money. You got no prospects. You're trying to stay alive. You're trying to stay out of prison. But this guy can sit back and play the long game. Much harder for us to do it. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So, you know, the, the only advantage we had is that when we were able to maintain our secrecy and security, like for, for example, in South Armagh, we were able very often to get on top of the Brits. You know, in, in South Armagh, I'm sure you've heard of the yeah. South Armagh IRA. Uh, that was one area definitely where the Brits were on the back foot, where the IRA held the initiative. And it was all down to a very small handful of people, very small, but they weren't penetrated. They were highly courageous, determined, motivated patriots. And, um, and the IRA had that caliber in every area, Belfast, Derry and that, but they had a particular concentration in South Armagh and, and, and what they had in particular in South Armagh was they had no informants. And I think they, they, they showed like one in six, like Cross McGlenn is a very small town. I mean, it's unbelievable how small Cross McGlenn is if you go into it. But one in six British soldiers killed during the Troubles was killed within three miles of that town square, right? And, uh, you know, um, I'm talking now as a soldier, as a in resistance, you know, uh, somebody who's involved in resistance. Uh, I, don't, I don't mean to come across as cold or, you know, talking about people being killed and like, like it's a good thing. It's not a good thing. But um, there was a war on. And that area was highly effective. Uh, again, no informants. And I just sometimes wonder what the IRA could have done if it had replicated that in one or two more areas. I think it had been, a, you know, I think we, we'd have been on top of the situation. Uh, whereas I believe towards the end, by the time the IRA had signed up to the Good Friday Agreement, that, that the British very much held the initiative and were very much in control of the strategic environment across the board. Uh, even though the IRA tried to portray it as a stalemate, uh, there was no stalemate. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, the Brit outside of a small enclave in South Armagh, the Brits could basically go anywhere they wanted mm -hmm. and they commanded the whole area. Excuse me. <coughs> the IRA certainly couldn't do that. We were infiltrated. Like, I don't think we had uh, senior members of MI5 working for us, giving us information, but they had our, I mean, they had our head at a security, Scapatici, you probably heard of him, mm -hmm. Steak Knife, the head of IRA security, that the man in charge of our security was a British agent for years. And uh, a lot of people believe that's just the tip of the iceberg. You know, it's scary when you think about it, you know. How many British soldiers were there and how many people were in the IRA? Well, uh, tens of thousands of British soldiers uh, went through uh, the North over 30 years. It was, I, I don't know the number, but I know around the time of the hunger strikes uh, and around the time I joined the IRA, there were 30,000 Crown forces in the North. If you take regular British Army, UDR, RUC, in a, in a six county area, approximately 30,000. And uh, there would have been at the most, maybe 300 active IRA men, you know, but there would have been a, you know, a large amount of helpers and things like that. But, uh, you know, but you find in, in areas, it was a very small number of IRA men really did the operations. It was a very small number. And I think people would like, again, I talk about South Amal, but how shocked people would be if they knew how small a number of people was actually doing the main operations there. It was just a handful of people, but they kept it tight. They kept it quiet. Uh, it was harder to do that in the cities. You had more men, and I think the Brits had more opportunity to, to infiltrate. But I mean, every area produce top caliber man. I mean, Bobby Sands was from Belfast, you know, Francis Hughes from South Derry. Um, every area uh, produced uh, very high caliber people, you yeah. know, but uh, don't get me wrong. I mean, I mean, uh, there were people in the IRA who shouldn't have been in it. You know, and as I said, there were people who were complete waste of space, waste of space, you know, and uh, that weakened us. But uh, on the whole, like I said, I couldn't have maintained you know, a lifetime of commitment to that, unless I was uh, inspired by the people around yeah. me. And for the most part, I was. The news is a very powerful tool to manipulate any human being. Like, yeah. Was there any other bombings that were blamed on the IRA that we weren't? There were definitely bombings. And, and, and 
Mo the IRA never deliberately kills civilians, right? Uh, I would never have joined an organization that would deliberately kill some guy's family walking down the street. I mean, he, he just, but it happened. It happened. Uh, a lot of times it happened uh, because of um, uh, uh, lack of attention to detail. Uh, maybe have to phone in a warning and not realize that the three phone boxes in a row are broken. You know, things like that. Uh, um, lack of attention to detail, like I said, uh, lack of planning. Uh, but there were cases, definitely, where the dark hand of British intelligence was involved in some uh, atrocities by um, uh, tampering with devices and things like that. And I believe in the next couple of years, I I, I don't want to uh, I don't want to go too far with this because I don't want to betray confidence. But I believe in the, in the next couple of years, there's a couple of things are going to come out that's going to make that clearer uh, on a number of uh, a number of operations that were um, actually acts of, acts of sabotage on behalf of the British state, or in which IRA men working for the Brits, you know, that yes, that did happen. I mean, that absolutely did happen. But I don't want to absolve the IRA from blame for things they were involved in, where innocent civilians were killed, where it was due to uh, incompetence or whatever on their part, because that did happen too. But I, I, I would never have joined an organization. I mean, if somebody told me I'm going to go out and I'm going to deliberately kill civilians, you know, I'd shoot them myself. <laughs> you know, I know seriously. Like, I mean, you, you, you know, you, oh my God, you, you know, um, not it, it, it was not only it, it was to kill innocent civilians. Like, it, it's morally wrong, and it's politically wrong. It, 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 it damages the struggle. It sabotages what you're fighting for. I mean. You know, you want to look back at history someday if we achieve our full goals and look back with pride at what we've done. And, you know, you you, you can't look back at, at, at innocent civilians killed with, with pride. Nobody could do that. Now, having said that, I was never involved in an operation that killed innocent civilians. Uh, I was never, um, the vast majority, the vast overwhelming majority of IRA men were never involved in operations where innocent civilians were killed. There was a small handful of cases where that did happen. And it was either uh, the result of um, incompetence poor intelligence, or in a number of cases, and I, like I said, I believe this may come out in the next two or three years, uh, the dark and bridge intelligence was involved in some of them, mm -hmm. you know. It is hard to see other humans killing other humans. Like for me personally, there shouldn't be any wars, but yeah. I've said this before on that podcast, but if somebody was to invade Scotland, like we've never been invaded, we've never had other people here trying to take over our country. Yeah. And I can assure you, if somebody trying to invade yeah. Scotland, I'd be the first to grab a rifle and stand to try and protect my family. Do you know what I mean? Like you'd, people... send, them, you'd send them home to think again. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Wouldn't you? Yeah. Wouldn't you? Of course, man. Of course, so what you're going to do. It's hard for people yeah. to make assumptions yeah. and think. Yeah. You never want to see any humans hurt any no, humans. Like, no, this is no. a, But this has been going on for hundreds of years. Yeah. Wars, power, yeah. Yeah. greed. It is, it is. And, it, you know, uh, it, and it's tough to... When you, for someone who joins maybe a resistance organization with the highest ideals and makes the most sacrifices and then turns out other people at a higher level are maybe working to a different agenda to see can they get a career out of it or see what they can get out of it. You know, th th this corruption is what kind of kills a lot of this stuff, you know, and uh, why a lot of people sometimes end up demoralized and disillusioned. Um, I, uh, yeah, it's a terrible thing. Um, I, I don't consider myself... Well, as a soldier, I will do what a soldier needs to do. Uh, but I don't. I don't. I would never consider myself a cruel person. I, I have empathy. I have sympathy. Uh, um, I mean, I trained with the British Parachute Regiment when I was in recon. They came over and they were doing some amphibious boat training with us. I went out and socialized with them, had drinks with them, had a good time, had fun. You know, even though at the time I knew them in the north. And even at the time, I knew I was going to join the array, and someday I might be shooting at these guys. But like, you know, it, it's Can not. Can you understand that they're doing their job also? Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, as James Connolly said at his at, at his thing at his uh, execution, when he was asked, "Would he pray for the firing party?" He said, um, "He said I, I respect all brave men who who do their duty. You know, I, I can understand that absolutely. But you know, I had a duty to do. They have a duty to do." Uh, 
and uh it's it's unfortunate that's the way the world is you know but um you know the big picture for me is ireland has you know ireland never invaded anybody ireland never partitioned another country ireland never planted another country you know i mean i think ireland needs to be uh a fully independent country at some stage, 32 county, uh, and build a joint civic identity, a joint national identity, you know, and that can never happen while the Brits are in there, in the mix, uh, underwriting the sectarian supremacy of one small faction in our country who make up like 18% of our country, yet, you know, 2% of the UK, and yet seem to be able to say no to everybody at all the time, you know. Uh, I understand that um, they have their beliefs, but, um, you know, one of the ironies of it is, is that Irish Republicanism was founded by Protestants. The United Irishmen were founded in 1791. You see, through the long history of Irish resistance and Irish rebellions, the vast majority of the um, the rebels and things like that wanted either to restore a Gaelic aristocracy to Ireland or have a Catholic king. It was the United Irishmen founded by uh, Wolf Tone and, and, and people like that in 1791 who were the first to come up with the concept of Ireland as a sovereign, independent republic in its own right. They were the first. And of the 28 founding members of the United Irishmen, 26 were Northern Presbyterians and two were Anglicans. All were Protestants. So the Irish Republican movement was founded exclusively by Protestants. You know, one of the ironies of history. But you see, they were Protestants of the Enlightenment. And they saw themselves as Irishmen, and they didn't believe for one second that just because they were Protestant, they couldn't be Irish, right? But then you then you have, you know, the Protestantism that comes from the plantation tradition that sees itself as, um, as uh, colonial settlers, as a sort of garrison for England, and believe that that gives them unique rights because they were here on a civilizing mission to tame the Irish, tame the Gael, you know, that type of thing. And uh, all this stuff's in the mix, you know. Do you think Ireland will ever be independent? Uh, fully independent? I, well, I I don't know. I don't know because while it might be united uh, territorially, the thing about it is with the Good Friday Agreement, you see, the, the unity they're talking about under the Good Friday Agreement is it maintains the sectarian dynamic. In other words, under the Good Friday Agreement, it says if Ireland is united, you can stay British or you can stay Irish. You know, the whole point and the whole, well, you can stay British, you can stay Irish, and it retains institutional links with the crown, that the unionists can be seen at what I would call as some sort of post-colonial rump, you know. The whole point of Irish Republicanism was to break the connection with England and to develop a joint civic identity. Like in America, when I grew up, Italians, Irish, Blacks, every culture, every religion, every um, imaginable uh, uh diverse group you can have, but you have one overriding uh, loyalty to the American Republic. India, 2.1 billion people, right? Uh, 2,000 ethnic groups and 15 official languages, and they're one united republic. Ireland, right? Half the population of London, right? Uh, Catholic tradition, uh, nationalist tradition, union tradition, and we can't be one united republic. You know, it, it does, but and, and the reason we can't is because there is a foreign government in the mix underwriting the supremacy of one section of our people, and it's breaking that connection with England. That 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 wolf tone uh, that the Protestant founders of republicanism uh, believed was the only way to eventually build a national identity, and and I believe that's still. I mean, the the first Italian. Uh, Prime Minister Adorno, when it, Italy used to be just a bunch of different city-states, he says, first we have to make Italy, then we can make Italians. You know what I mean? Same situation in Ireland. We have a partitionist mindset in the South because of partition. We have a unionist mindset in the North because of the Union. And I don't believe we'll ever really have an Irish Republican mindset until we have a, a full Irish Republic. Mm -hmm. What are you thinking your first night after you get 35 years? I was thinking... Did you qu start questioning your whole life? decision making or were you still just proud to be the soldier and willing to basically die or do life in prison <laughs> i wasn't too proud at yeah. <laughs> i was thinking you know i'm I, you know i was thinking i'm sick of these fuckers informing me mm -hmm. up, up at the top i'm sick of them fuckers. why you though 
What? Oh, not I don't mean me no, but personally. Why you like, kept getting informed on like, No, no, it was, uh, it was a bunch people. of fellas. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. That's 45 yeah. years yeah. Yeah. from informants. Like. Yeah. I'd still be in jail today. Now, you know, only for the Good Friday Agreement. And people say to me, you don't support the Good Friday Agreement. And I don't because I support the Irish Republic and it can come from the Good Friday Agreement. But when we talk about the peace process, just I want to be clear, I support the peace. I'm glad there's peace now. I, I would not advocate a return to war, but my criticism is with the process, because where the process leads, where it can't be to Irish Republican goals. But to answer your question, James, I remember I remember more or less my first day in Belmarsh, you know, uh, a prison within a prison, like a concrete tomb this was. like. And I remember waking up my first morning in there thinking, like, I just done 10 years, you know, and I'm 10 years in Port Leash, you know, <laughs> writing off the years, you know, I'm out in 10 years, I'm out in 10 years. There's me, I'm out 20 months and I'm back in. And I, for, basically I know forever, you know, and, uh, and I deeply suspect that I was back in because of informers, you know, or an informer at some stage. Now, um, uh, the British security s services at the time said there was no informer. It was all a result of surveillance. That's possibly true, but, um, I have two things. One is the security forces never admit to an informer for obvious reasons because they want to protect them. And second of all, just, I, I can't really go into it, but I have my reasons to believe, very good reasons to believe from what happened and things that were, that came out in the trial that an informer was involved. So yeah, you know, it's, at, at some stage you kind of get sick of your own people informing on you, you know, you get a bit tired mm -hmm. of it, you know, but look at, I'm alive. Uh, I know a lot of guys were killed because of informers. Inform informers got them killed. The SES are waiting on them, you know? I mean... Uh, what did they gain from that? Uh, saving were their they, own skins. Were they getting money or were they getting so, less sentences themselves? Like? Uh, well, basically save their own skins. But uh, people became informers. There's people who became informers at a low level just to keep the driver's license. Maybe a taxi driver. Mm -hmm. And he stopped for, you know, drunk driving one night. And the cops say, right, we can make this go away. And he become an informer to save his tra driver's license and maybe get some other man killed. You know, uh, low-level informers were just as dangerous because, you see, people think, assume, you know, you have to be at the top of the IRA to be any use. But, like, if you're a driver, right, and you're just driving IRA in the meetings, you don't have to be at the meeting. You just tell, you know, the MI5 or the IEC Special Branch where that meeting's held. They bug that house. So they're sitting in on the meeting. So even the lowest level informer can be extremely dangerous and get people killed. Uh, people inform for all kinds of reasons. And one one thing, uh, but mostly is to save their skin, you know. But one thing that really surprised me, right, is, um, uh, you know, I consider myself, you know, I, I, I can be tough enough. You know, I, I I can put up with a lot, but I'm still the same type type of guy. If your mate there came in, your producer came in there and said, somebody stole my wallet, I'd probably take a redner, you know, <laughs> even though it had nothing to do with me, you know, I, you know, but, you know, so I kind of thought informers would be um, furtive, nervous, you know, but what, what I found out from talking to people who had interrogated informants and stuff over the years, some guys thrive on it. There's a personality type that thrives on being an informer uh, in believing they got one over on you, that they're smart on you, that they're running rings around you. And the Brits tell them, oh, oh, no, 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 you're not, you're not an informer. You're not a tout. You're an agent. You're James Bond, you know, and they can play these guys and play their personalities. So one thing that really, really, um, that surprised me that, that, you know, some people thrive on being informers. Uh, another thing about being an informer for some people is, in a perverse way, being an informer, but not known, being known to be an informer can really enhance your status in some communities. Because say uh, uh, you're a known IRA man in, a, in an area and uh, you're an informer. So you know you're not going to be shot by the sash. You know loyalists aren't going to take you out of it. And uh, you know that if the IUC are going to get anybody shot, they're going to send them to somebody else's door, not yours, right? So that gives people a bit of swagger then. It gives it, you know, a bit of swagger because they know they're untouchable. untouchable. So, but that swagger is seen by other people. And they think, geez, that guy's got balls. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? In, in, a, in a strange way, it kind of enhances their prestige. And for a lot of people, you know, um, there are people who will, who will betray the IRA to actually keep the prestige of being known as an IRA man. The prestige of being an IRA man means more to them than what the IRA stands for, than the IRA goals. They'll actually betray the IRA 
to be so they can stay being known as an Irene man to get the prestige that that mm -hmm. comes up. It's 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 a very bizarre. It's I can't get my head around it, yeah. but I know it, it it it's there. Like you know, it exists. What's the worst thing you've seen while involved in Irene? Well, I I couldn't really go into that, yeah, James. Yeah. I couldn't go into that, you mm -hmm. know, because uh, you know. But uh, do you get the get PTSD? Do you struggle with the past? Or do you kind of just have to go on with it? No, I, I, I struggle with the future, James. I struggle that what we fought for, our goals aren't there, that we're not on the trajectory for this all island republic. We're on a, tra a trajectory that brings us to a further division, a so-called United Ireland where you can be British or Irish. So this so-called shared island, right, that they're talking about now instead of a United Ireland, a shared island where we share in Britain's analysis of the nature of the conflict, we share in the colonial legacy of sectarian apartheid, and we share in the imperial project of divide and rule. I didn't, we didn't fight to share it in that way. We fought to unite our country and to unite it in the only way that matters, united as citizens, you know, Protestant Catholic together as citizens. And I know, you know, uh, you know, there's, there's a tradition in Ireland. I'm not blind to it. I know unionists uh, uh, don't want to be part of it. And I know that on the 12th of July every year, many unionists celebrate the defeat of Ireland. They celebrate um, the start of the Protestant ascendancy and all that flowed from that, the, uh, the, the, land, the land wars, the famine, and you know they celebrate and rejoice in everything that went wrong in Ireland because you know they just celebrate that, right? But you know, on the other hand, there is that DNA uh, in, 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 in the Protestant culture that was that were the founding fathers of Irish republicanism, and so you have that dichotomy. You have like in 1791, Protestants founded the United Irishmen to fight sectarianism. In 1795, Protestants founded the Orange Order to fight the United Irishmen. Yeah, so so you're, switched. you're gonna yeah well as you know, uh, Protestants motivated by mm -hmm. the Enlightenment founded the United Irishmen. Protestants motivated by plantation sectarian supremacy founded the Orange Order. What changed that? Well, that hasn't really changed. Yeah. That hasn't really changed. You still have uh, Protestants, or I should say, Unionists in the North, but they're all, they're who celebrate on the twelfth. The um, you know the, the the how hard does that see Irishmen celebrating the twelfth of a defeated other Irishmen? Like, yeah, is that weird for you, or is that no, do no, you understand no? It I, I understand it. I I can understand it, right? Mm. I can understand it, and I understand their fears. You know, you see. Catholic nationalism in Ireland. You see, I, 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 I can, I'm an Irish Republican, and people think automatically that means you're a Catholic nationalist. But Catholic nationalism is a sort of different thing. Catholic, a lot of Catholic nationalists, uh, if they had their way, would actually uh, love to see get rid of Protestants, things like that. I think the Protestant tradition and culture. The Enlightenment Protestant one is, is a very important thing in our in our country. It's it's it, 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 it's why our flag is green, white, and orange. You know, it stands for not an agreed Ireland where people agree to disagree about the constitutional source of our sovereignty, but a united Ireland. That it's about a united Ireland, and uh, it's an important tradition. And um, the the um, but a lot of a lot of, a lot of Catholic nationalists who a lot of them be quite right wing and almost fascist tendency, some of them would have been quite happily see Protestants ground into into the dirt if they had got a chance in their day. They they would have been quite happily seen that, or maybe even expelled from the country. So I don't I don't blame Protestants when when they when when the Home Rule thing came, first came up for for being against Home Rule because they said Home Rule was Rome Rule. I wouldn't want Rome Rule for Ireland either. I wouldn't want a, a Catholic run Ireland. Right, but um, where, where I disagree with them is 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 where uh, they're, they're, it, it isn't their Protestant religion that they're that they're um, fighting for. It's their sense of supremacy as colonial settlers uh, uh, on behalf of England, on behalf of Britain. You know the type of thing. Uh, that that's where I I kind of draw the line. And the thing about it is, uh, I understand their point of view, but. I believe the Republic has, has has to win. I believe the Republic has to gain supremacy over that yeah. at some stage. Yeah. What did you do then after the Good Friday Agreement when you think you're going to spend the rest of your life in prison to then get released? Like, what was the plan then? I had no plan. I thought I was going to either escape or die in jail, you know, or, or you know, or, or I get out. I would still be in prison. 
some people criticize me because uh, uh, because I, I blatantly say I'm, I'm against the Good Friday Agreement. But I'm against the process. I'm not against the peace. That's very important to understand. And they say, well, you got out under the Good Friday Agreement. But you know, you have to bear in mind, when we got out under the Good Friday Agreement, we didn't really know what it was about. We, we didn't know anything. And we were being told that this would lead to Irish Republican goals eventually. And if we could lead to Irish Republican goals through peaceful means, I'm very happy with that. That, that happy days, that, that's better, you know? So I had no problem with the ceasefire and I had no problem with uh, the Good Friday Agreement initially. But it took a long time for the pen, penny for me to drop that as time went on, as time went on, uh, Sinn Féin and the provost got wrote more, wrote more and more into the British system. Uh, by 2007, when I resigned, they were recognizing the PSNI as the lawful, which is our British constabulary in Ireland, as the lawful authority in Ireland. Now, no Republican recognizes the lawful authority of anything in Ireland except the constitutional authority of the Irish people to make Irish laws. When you recognize the police force or the police service of, of a foreign government, it, it, it abrogates, it totally denies everything republicanism stands for. So that's when I resigned at that point. But I was willing up to then to give it a chance, you know, to see where it would go. And I worked for Sinn Féin quite hard at times. And, uh, but now uh, I see them as, um, I actually see Sinn Féin as uh, an impediment to Irish republicanism, as, uh, as, uh, as almost allied with the British government in the sense that they have completely um, uh, been co-opted to a British strategy and completely co-opted to a, the British analysis of, of their role in Ireland. And uh, Sinn Féin, uh, you know, when Martin McGuinness shook hands with the Queen in England, the, the, the Queen of England, it, you, uh, you probably were that, James, when she came over, right? That was symbolizing, you know, she didn't wait in line to shake his hand. He went, he waited in line to shake her hand. And, and nothing against the woman personally, but she is the crown and the symbol of the British state and British jurisdiction in Ireland. And uh, that handshake was saying to, to the world that the British crown still has a role to play in a so-called future United Ireland, right? And uh, the entire purpose of our struggle was to break the connection with England, you know, and and develop a joint civic identity. Not strain for that. Strengthen, yeah, not, not not to bake in the, the sectarian division, bake in the British-Irish mm. cleavage and national loyalties into per per perpetuity. Does that handshake strengthen it? Strengthen Britain and Ireland? I think it does, Instead Absolutely. of trying to break away from, like yeah, you say, it, trying it, to break it, away it, from it England. It's it, because what it says is, you, you have a legitimacy here. You, I am recognizing as that you have a legitimacy in this country. You have a role to play in the future here. And we were trying to get rid of that. So I found that very disconcerting. <laughs> How hard is that for you, a man who spent 10 years in prison, nearly 35 years in prison to then, then what were you fighting for? Well, at that, at that point, I realized that there's a saying that if you want to achieve something, right, you have to surround yourself with people who are on the same mission as you. And I thought we were all on the same mission to achieve the Irish Republic. Uh, but when Martin McGuinness shook hands with the Queen of England, I realized there were members of the leadership and others who were on a different page, a totally different page. And I had a strong, uh, uh, I got a very strong impression that the Brits were writing the page and turning the page, you know what I mean? So um, again, like I, I do support the peace. Um, and people then, you know, I'm often asked, well, look at, if you don't think this is going to work, then the what is the solution? Do you go back to war? But the thing about it is, you see, and people need to remember, there was never a need for war in Ireland, ever. There was never a need for war. If, if Britain had respected the wishes of the vast majority of Irish people in this country, there would never have been war, right? Uh, I remember the uh, British Secretary of State, Peter Brook, a Northern Ireland Secretary of State, Peter Brook, in the early 1990s, and he said that the British government was not against the concept of a sovereign Irish Republic, only against its violent expression. But in 1918, there was a peaceful election in which the overwhelming majority of the Irish people voted for an Irish Republic in the 1918 32 county All Ireland elections. Overwhelming, 76% voted for an All Irish Republic. And the British responded with partition, and they responded with the black and tans. You know, so we have to 
you know, put things in perspective. And uh, while the IRA has to take responsibility for what it done and for the wrong things it done, you know, uh, from an Irish Republican perspective, the uh, the primary root cause of violence in Ireland is the British presence. And the British presence is not the unionist. It is not the unionist. The British presence is the presence of Britain's claim to jurisdiction in Ireland and the civil and military apparatus that makes that possible. Mm -hmm. How hard was it to resign from the IRA? Was it an easy decision or was it something you thought about? By that time, it was a very easy decision. It was a very easy decision. And when I resigned, I told uh, a, a relative of mine used to visit me in Portlaoise Prison from time to time. And they said to me, I told him I resigned. They said to me, oh my God, you must be devastated. You've given your life to this. And uh, you've been to jail and it's everything, you know, you, you live for this. Oh, you must be devastated. And I says, no. I says, no. I says, I feel like an anchor has been lifted off my neck. I said, I'll never again have to go into a Sinn Féin meeting and listen to that delusional bullshit that if we go along with an internal settlement on British terms, that we're going to somehow reach an Irish Republic, that in some way British the British government was going to legislate for the Irish Republic. It was insanity. I mean, it was just, it was just counterintuitive in every way. A lot of people made money out of it. A lot of people did well out of it, got holiday homes out of it and, and you know, nice little lives. But, uh, you know, I, I preferred to keep my integrity and uh, as an Irish Republican and, 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 and you know, and uh, to, to, to maintain my re Republican politics. Mm -hmm. And uh, I felt I couldn't do that anymore in Sinn Féin or in the provost. As I said earlier, you know, I didn't fight the, I didn't join the provost to fight for the provost. I joined the provost to fight for the Irish Republic, and when they uh, when they went off that path, then I I went off them, and I have no problem with that. So, what have you done with your life then since you left? Uh, wrote a book. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, James, uh, nothing really much. Uh, see, the trouble is, I'd love I I'd love uh, I'd love to be in peaceful. Violence. Republic, mm -hmm. well, peaceful, well, even peaceful political, mm -hmm. you know, I'd, I, I'd love to be involved in politics. I'd love to be, I used to enjoy, I mean, I, I enjoyed this. I enjoyed, even when this, the ceasefire was on, when I was still with Sinn Féin, I enjoyed elections. I enjoyed, you know, working, you know, to, to get our team on board when I thought our team was on board the Republic, you know, and then when I copped on it, it wasn't going that direction. I left, but, uh, I, I enjoyed that. I, uh, I miss, uh, I, I, you know, I joined the IRA when I was young and idealistic, and now I'm I'm old and idealistic, but I'm still inspired by the, the concept of of an Irish Republic, and I would love to work politically towards that. I would love it. I would love to be involved in, in you know peaceful political agitation. The trouble is, is uh, republicanism in Ireland, which used to be a strong, united, uh, cohesive force, has now been broken into like a pane of glass into dozens of different pieces, and each piece thinks it's the real Republican movement. So you, see, you have all these Republican groups uh, in Ireland now, and a lot of them have, you know, preconditions. You know, if Ireland isn't socialist, then it's not worth it. Or if, if Ireland isn't Catholic, it's not worth it. Or if Ireland isn't this or that, it's not worth it, right? Instead of the bottom line, which I believe it should be, does Irish constitutional authority reside within the Irish people, or does it not? That to me is the bottom line. Uh, the Irish people should make up be the only people in Ireland who make its laws and who decide its course. And, you know, uh, and then you get into the argument with some people like, well, then why would it be in the European Union? You don't have sovereignty there. But again, that's another argument. But the thing about it is, I think the bottom line is uh, to end British jurisdiction in this country. And, and, and if there was um, if there was a peaceful political way to do that, I'd be as involved as ever. I hope that can happen. I, I hope mm -hmm. that will come to fruition. Do you, you think know? the troubles will start back again? That's totally up to the British. I think that's totally up to the British because, like I said, in 1918, we had a peaceful election and the British answered that with the Black and Tans and Partition. You see, Partition wasn't brought in to defend uh, the rights of unions. Partition was brought in specifically to deny the, right the right of Ireland as a whole to national self-determination. And Britain, you know, a lot of people say, and a lot of Irish people say, oh, the, the Brits want to leave. The Brits don't want to be here and they'd love to be out of here. Yeah, your, your average British citizen probably does. But the British intelligence and security services are not going to leave that massive island at their back door on their western flank 
and not be uh, totally uh, on top of what's happening there because it's a major strategic interest for them. I mean, the British are in Yemen, they're in Iraq, they're in places around the world, you know, uh, halfway around the world, trying to manipulate and shape the strategic environment to suit them. Does anybody seriously think they're just going to walk out of Ireland and close the door behind them? They're, they're, they're going to leave Ireland uh, if they can in a way that, that suits them and would a former government that, that suits their strategic interests. And uh, whether it starts up again or not, uh, I certainly hope not. But, you know, people say the war is over. and But I don't believe that for one in one sense. Britain declared war on the Irish Republic uh, uh, when it was declared in 1919. They outlawed the 32-county dollar and, and they outlawed the Irish Republic. They're still at war with that Irish Republic. The British are. They work against it every day and they're always trying to manipulate uh, the political situation here to ensure that never comes to pass. Now, there's no resistance to that. There's no arm resistance to that. There's no, so there's nobody fighting on the Irish side against that. And hopefully then there never will. Because I don't think there'll ever be a need to be. Because the simple matter is the vast majority of the Irish people would vote for Irish independence tomorrow if they were given that choice. I mean, unionists are only uh, a majority now in two of the six counties, mm -hmm. you know. But uh, I think to paraphrase something Martin Luther King once said, um, British rule in Ireland is probably in its death throes. The only question is how expensive are they going to make the funeral, you know? And, and time will tell on that. See the guy, the mob boss from Boston, James White, a bulger? Yeah. He then became a known informant for the FBI. Do you ever think he could have stuck no, in? No, he didn't. He definitely didn't. I'll tell you why. He was, he was an informant, apparently. But I don't think he was, like, telling them every little thing that happened. I think he... They were working on a strategy. Uh, he was giving them information on the Italian mafia in the north end of Boston. Uh, uh, FBI guys were, were were rolling up the mafia and they were getting promotions and they were getting great kudos from the FBI for doing this. And th and they let Whitey run, I think, run, run amok. Excuse me. But um, there's two reasons why I don't think he informed on it. One, I don't believe for one moment that the FBI would have allowed us to leave American territorial waters with those arms for two reasons. One's we could have sank, which we... Came within a hair's yeah. breadth of doing, right? Mm -hmm. That close. The second is they weren't going to hand the credit for the investigation and, your, uh, and arrest of that to a foreign jurisdiction. Did you think about him, those being a suspect? Uh, at the start, until I realized the Irish Navy was waiting for us behind the Skellig Rocks on our way into Kenmare Bay, where the um, it's, it's, a, it's a small little islands where um, mm -hmm. our radar couldn't pick them up. Now, why do you didn't know we were going there? But they knew. So... I didn't know. Whitey didn't know. Mm -hmm. So no, I, I actually don't believe. I don't believe. Sean O'Callaghan definitely informed, and somebody in the area leadership told me to come now, bring everything, and you be on the boat, mm -hmm. which made absolutely no sense, and actually fucked everything up. Uh, so Whitey Bull, just like some story, because I know you were coming on, and I know there was a connection, but this man was on the run for 16 years. Yeah. Um, FBI second most wanted above Bin Laden. Yeah. Over a million pound, uh, bonus you would have got if you'd found out any information for him but he ended up around for 16 years get captured at 82 years old and then beaten to death in prison yeah. just three four years ago but i believe in a wheelchair but the thing is the thing is this uh, a few media um interviewers have taken me to task for working with whitey bulger and they come up with all the stuff we know now because movies and books stuff i didn't know he murdered this one he murdered that one he murdered this he murdered that I yeah, did. He was a mobster. He was. Uh, he was a mobster. I, I, I knew he was a gangster. Uh, don't mm. get me wrong. I don't deny for a second. I mean, I put it in a book. I work with him. But I didn't know, you know, uh, some of the really bad stuff he was doing, like murdering. Uh, yeah, he murdered uh, a girlfriend of Steve Fleming and pulled her teeth. I mean, he didn't, he didn't tell us that. Um, but the thing is, the FBI knew. You see, here, pe people give out to me. Oh, you work with this guy. You must have known. I didn't know. I didn't know. But the FBI knew. They knew, and they were they were letting him run, and they let him they they let him on, and I firmly believe, with no evidence, <laughs> that the FBI had him killed because they put him in a, in a prison, in an open area, and let it be known he was there, and that let it be known he's an informer, and he was he was killed almost immediately. 
And I mean, I was talking to some guys from Boston recently, and they're absolutely convinced he was set up. He just knew too much. He just knew too much about the FBI. Uh, and uh, to save, I think, embarrassment, they just had him. They just had him took out. Yeah. I, have, oh, I have no doubt about it. You in know? his wheelchair, in his 90s, in his cell, that, even though the, the bad stuff it's He's done. Like, look, I wouldn't wish that on anybody. Yeah. He, No, I, I wouldn't. A few people said to me, oh, you deserved it. I wouldn't wish that on anybody. The guy's nearly 90. He's in a wheelchair. He's half blind. He's doddering, apparently. And they beat him to death with a lock and a sock. They, they gouged his eyes out and cut his tongue out, apparently. No, I mean, you know, um, you know, it's hard to believe now meeting this this fit guy I knew then, this confident, you know, gangster. And, you know, he ruled the world. He ruled Boston anyway. You know, if only, if only you know, he'd have known the end he was going to come up to, man. My God. Yeah. But, um uh yeah he was uh he was some character um I, I talk in the book too about uh whitey and his henchman stevie flemmy coming down i was in a basement one time <clears throat> excuse me and i was drilling out the serial numbers of weapons before we sent them home so they couldn't be traced if they were caught and uh i got very nervous i i got well apprehensive i should say because they never came down there and i was on my own i was in the corner and see it crossed my mind on a, on a number of occasions that this was this this operation was growing legs it was getting too complicated too big and that it could be interfering with whitey's business and uh it crossed my mind a few times that he could maybe take me out you know wouldn't be hard to do put me in a lobster pot then i know six months later no sign of me i already sent somebody over where's john oh we gave john two hundred thousand dollars to bring him over to you guys you ain't seen him you know, John's in Vegas with the fucking money, you know. That crossed my mind, you know. I, but even though I didn't know a lot of the stuff he was at, by then I had heard enough from people he was working with to know that he was a capable killer and that. But I, I thought in gang wars and stuff, and if, you know, if, if criminals were killing criminals, there was no skin off my nose. I, I mean, I didn't, basically, I didn't care. It, it's nothing to do with me, as long as, you know, I could get my work done, you know. And, uh, uh, so I was in the corner of this basement, this real dark basement, and uh, Stephen Flemmy and the other boy were talking to me, and I couldn't understand what they were down there. They'd never come down there before, and uh, none of the guns were loaded. And I remember thinking, oh, my God, I'm, I should have a loaded gun here. Like, I really thought there's something going on here. But they did leave. They left. And uh, afterwards, though, I found out that John McIntyre, who was on the Valhalla with us, was murdered in a basement. And... Uh, because I presume they didn't have that many basements, I'm 99% sure that was the same basement that a few weeks later they murdered him in. And also I later found out that there were bodies buried under the, in the basement too. So when I was drilling out the serial numbers, there was probably five or six bodies buried under me, you know? Why is such a man at high caliber surrounding himself with guns and that? Like, should he not have been far away from them? Um, or did he just enjoy the buzz? Well, when you have the FBI protecting you, you can do whatever right, you exactly. like. Exactly, yeah, yeah, yeah. You can do whatever you like. Yeah, yeah he wasn't worried. Feel untouchable. And again, when you think about it, I never thought about the time, but he, the confidence he betrayed. See, I didn't know he was working with the FBI, right? Uh, obviously. And uh, <coughs> the confidence he betrayed and the swagger that he had and the confidence that he had would kind of give you confidence, you know? And, uh, but he had that confidence because he knew he was untouchable, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so when you think back about it now, it, it's like this this circle, you know, you're, you're, um, you can project an air of uh, of invincibility because you know you're invincible, but not because you're invincible, but because the enemy have made you that way, you know? <laughs> so it's, it's you know, my God, you know? So what's the future hold for John Crowley? Well, um, I know what it hold for a lot of people. <laughs> I know what a lot of people like it to hold for me, but <laughs> mm. uh, I don't know. I'm 65 now, and um, uh, I might try and write a novel. Well, I, I read a novel before. And uh, basically the way this started was I wrote a novel and I spent about three years in it. And I thought it was a pretty good novel if I do say so myself. And when I was trying to get it published in the States, uh, the uh, American publisher was saying, yeah, your writing's good and all, but you know, your story, we want to hear your story. Ex-Marine, Whitey Bulger, IRA, all this shit. I says, I, I can't, I can't talk about that. I, you know, it's impossible. But anyway, one thing led to another. And I think I was able to write a bit of a memoir without incriminating me or anybody else, which was the main thing. I mean, the only person I mentioned in the book really is Martin McGinnis, and he's dead, so he cannot be charged or incriminated. Uh, but I don't, you know, name anybody else who could be incriminated. So I was very careful with that. And uh, anyway, to answer your question, James, 
Uh, maybe I'll polish up that novel now. I don't know. Or I might write something else. Like I'm 65 now. So like, what else am I going to do? I don't know. Yeah. I really don't know. But I, you know, I, I have a great family, a lovely wife. I have a 17 year old son, a uh, 16 year old daughter. And, you know, uh, I'm very happy in my personal life. I'm very happy. I'm very content. Uh, I'm, I'm devastated politically that we didn't get to where we needed to go. I was willing to give everything I had, every ounce I had to get where we needed to go. And so were a lot of people around me, but you know, we were, we were stymied. We were, we were, um, hamstrung by, by weaknesses where there shouldn't have been weak people. You know, that's what I believe. But, um, look at, uh, the main thing is, uh, will we get to the stage where we have a united Irish Republic someday? And I, I hope we will. And I hope we do it peacefully. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Where can people buy your book, John? The Yank? Well, it's in a number of uh, outlets, uh, various bookstores, Easton's, things like that. But it, it's online. It's on Amazon. Mm -hmm. And it can be bought directly from the publishers, which I believe is uh, is Melville House in uh, America and uh, Marion Press in Ireland. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's published on both sides of the Atlantic. Uh, but it's definitely on Amazon. Good. We will leave the links in the description. For coming on today, John, and telling your story, I thoroughly enjoyed that. For, would you like to finish up on anything? Not in particular, James. I really appreciate it. Um, my, myself and my wife, Debbie, we, we watch your podcast mm -hmm. quite often. Uh, so it's it's just amazing to be here. It's hard mm -hmm. to believe, actually. You uh -huh. know, it's a strange world. <laughs> John, listen, all <laughs> the best. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it, James. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.